No, well, thank you very much, B and Patrick, for inviting me uh, in today. And um, I hope you enjoy um, my small talk and that you will feel very free to ask any questions about anything you may feel I um, can help with. And so I'm here today with the um, secretary of the charity that uh, I founded for Bhutan, Sue, and she is also here and can answer questions uh, later if necessary. So I'm um, just going to begin and we'll travel in many different areas and then questions will come from there. So as you can see, I've just entitled the presentation uh, Set Free from Banking to Bhutan. And uh, of course, that's the uh, title of the book that I, I wrote. And uh, this is me um, with some accoutrements that I don't have now, such as hair and some gentle lipstick and a tasteful satin top. And uh, so this is obviously from my days in banking. I was working, I think I was working in private equity in London when this, um, when this photograph was taken. And um, the, uh, the book that I've uh, written here, uh, Set Free, is about the journey, my personal journey from a high-flying financial career eventually to becoming ordained as a Buddhist nun in Bhutan. And uh, you may well have seen some news about this already. So um, I'm going to start there, and we're going to lead on from there. So. Uh, just to clarify that um, I was uh, in New York and Hong Kong and London and various places being very fancy with suits and shoes etc and uh, very much um, wishing to be uh, successful in my life and uh, believing that a path of high-flying finance would bring me success and in some ways it did, obviously, but in other ways it um, brought up a lot of things for me which made me look very clearly at life. And the main, uh, the main thing, of course, was ending up being held hostage on a business trip in Jakarta, which was quite a surprise to me, as you can imagine, because you don't imagine that's going to happen to you. Uh, particularly because we have the notion that if we cover ourselves in money and things, we're very safe. We have this feeling this is where safety lies. And of course the very opposite <laughs> happened uh, because obviously I was held at gunpoint and, and uh, felt extremely terrified actually. So that's vaguely interesting, but uh, the most interesting part about it was actually uh, my feelings uh, when I managed to escape uh, from this situation. And um, that's really what surprised me. And I think that uh, response to a situation which uh, was obviously very um, terrifying and I could have felt a great deal of anger about uh, or vengeance about, that's really what was very interesting about the consequence of being held hostage. And so just as we start here, I'm just going to read a few lines from the book, if that's all right. And um, so you have to imagine that I have escaped from this hostage situation, and I am now with the, uh, uh, the army and the police, and we are going through some things, and he is, they're showing me some additional uh, knives, etc., that he had with him, and all this kind of thing. <clears throat> and then uh, they, they decide to show me a photograph of him like a Polaroid photograph that's come out of an instant Polaroid camera, yeah. And this is what I'm going to read to you now. I sat there, quite still, behind the table, looking at the photo I was holding. It was a little bigger than my palm. All it had in it was one man, his head slumped, hanging from his punched-out body, held there in the crease between the wall and the floor. I couldn't stop staring at the photo at the end of my arm. If he wasn't dead, he was in prison. I did not understand how our lives had come to this. How had our paths brought us together to end in this way? 
the sorrow I felt was overwhelming. He has to be okay, I thought. My eyes were still with his body in the photo, but inside I was pleading for reassurance that this broken man was going to recover, that his suffering would only be temporary. I was no longer hearing what the policeman was saying. But why? Why did I care so much for a man who had held my life at the end of his gun and about whom I knew nothing? I didn't understand, so I remained silent. I could not speak this strange wish out loud, surrounded as I was by my rescuers. Uh, so that experience um, of uh, deep compassion for somebody who had um, obviously wished me a great deal of harm was a real shock to me. And uh, um, I think it was the beginning of realising that despite everything, there was something quite kind in me, which I hadn't realised was there, because I had thought I was very intelligent and I was a high-flying financial person. I never, ever dreamed that I was that kind, to be honest. You know, it wasn't be something I'd particularly even respect. The idea of being a kind person wasn't up there on my agenda. And so that really was the, the little seed which was planted, I think, and which, in, in many ways, everything we see today comes from that moment. Everything I've done since, really, I believe, was uh, set in motion from that point. Yeah, and obviously you can ask me that about that um, later. So um, I am going to go right on now, <laughs> and um, I'm just yeah, you know thanking you for your support today. Here I am now, very different. You can see definitely lacking hair and lipstick. Here I am in eastern Bhutan in the Himalayas. This is in October last year. And this is at one of the two special needs schools that our charity really supports uh, in Bhutan. And uh, for those of you who have read the book or do read the book, then this here is Nakum. This is actually Nakum who's in the book. Yeah, She uh, played a very pivotal role in, in uh, uh, the development of the charity. So just so you've seen, uh, she is there. Uh, obviously... Um, when I was in the city thinking of me a lot <laughs> I didn't imagine that in the end I would be founding and running a charity for the benefit of other people uh, ironically the skills that I gained in my career have actually been incredibly useful now because I learned skills of um, confidence and project management and uh, analyzing things and inquiring into things and just taking responsibility for things which actually are very important in running an international uh, charity, I would say. But you have to bear in mind that many people haven't heard of Bhutan and they don't have a personal connection to Bhutan. And usually when people in the beginning feel they want to help somebody or something, they usually think it's something quite close to them. You know, like their relative had a problem and then they support that charity, you know. So part of the difficulty of, of uh, launching a charity for a country uh, that many people haven't visited or don't have a personal connection with is really about um, uh, building credibility, you can say, you know. And there are so many needs out there, you know, obviously. Um, and so this is why I like to flash these photos around, because um, uh, this was very helpful for the charity, being invited to meet um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who were both totally delightful. And this was in uh, Bhutan uh, in, uh, uh, a while back. And uh, um, my mother was personally very pleased that this happened as a, you know, eight-year-old British woman. Now this is Michael Rutland here. He's the British honorary consul to Bhutan, and uh, he's also been very wonderful at uh, supporting the charity uh, with this idea of, of linking the UK and uh, and Bhutan. So I'm very grateful for their their support for the charity. Um, now I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit more about. Compassion. I hope that, that those words are not too small for you. So I've put here, Bhutan through the lens of compassion. Um, now, you probably are very aware that uh, in Himalayan Buddhism, or Tibetan Buddhism, you can call it, 
There are two key qualities of mind which we're looking to develop. I mean, obviously, as a practitioner, our, our interest is no longer in these external phenomena. You know, unlike a scientist or a kind of a archaeologist or somebody like that, you know. Our interest is very much in the internal uh, uh, phenomena, very much on the uh, nature of mind and of actively training that. And the two qualities that we look to train, uh, on the one hand, are compassion, and then the other hand, are wisdom. And they both seem to be essential. You can't just have one uh, without the other, according to our teachings. And that was hard for me to understand at first, because I just thought, if you're just hugely compassionate, why on earth would you need any wisdom? I don't get it. You know, Surely compassion is always the answer. And it is, but in running a charity, I realized that there is a need for wisdom because in compassion, uh, uh, which is not fully considered, um, sometimes it couldn't be the wrong path, but you sometimes have to make conscious choices about where and to whom and how you are practicing compassion. So in running the charity, I think I've understood that a little bit more. The qualities of compassion and wisdom, which are associated with a male and a female enemy, which enem energy, not enemy, energy, uh, which is called yabhyum in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, very much come probably from, uh, or B probably knows this more than I do, but probably predate Tibetan Buddhism, probably coming from a yogic uh, heritage, um, where you have the sun and the moon, the male and the female, and they're thought to need to be uh, cleared and balanced. And, to come to perfect union. So these ideas of these two qualities probably even predate Tibetan Buddhism. Obviously they're essential in being a nun and they're essential in founding and running a charity. Now uh, for many years, uh, really since I was first uh, seriously interested in, in Buddhism, the uh, practice of compassion or the question of what compassion is the value of compassion, the power of compassion, was of great interest to me. And um, uh, this quality of compassion is often symbolized by this uh, figure of Chenrezig and uh, his accompanying mantra of compassion. Okay, so this is a standing Chenrezig. Chenrezig can be sitting, seated or standing. This is the standing form, again, recognizing uh, uh, probably an earlier mainland Indian uh, heritage. Uh, so this is a thousand arm chenrezig, so it's a standing form. It's hard to see maybe, but this white disc is uh, actually got lots of little arms in it, so it's a thousand arm chenrezig. That really is just when they say a thousand, it's just to um, try to quantify the idea of something which is limitless in nature. And uh, Buddhism has a lot of notions about mental qualities being limitless in nature not limited by time or space, in fact. And uh, so this is to imply a limitless mental quality of compassion. That's the thousand arm chin, is it? And um, uh, so this is, uh, if you can see it, as an attempt to describe or make tangible for you a mind of limitless compassion. Yeah. So as a practitioner, this in some ways symbolizes how I wish my mind to develop. Um, that's a goal, you can say. Now, uh, maybe a little hard to see here, but actually this version of Chenrezig, the standing version of Chenrezig, on a moon disc, on a lotus, uh, flower. This is very typical of um, representations of the mind in the Himalayan tradition. This uh, this one also has eleven heads here, and I uh, I really like. There are many stories about why this representation has eleven heads, but I um, I really find one of these stories very useful. So, one story goes like this that. Um, Chenrezig, with this mind of compassion, wishes to help other beings, wishes to free other beings from suffering. 
uh, because Buddhism, again, very similar to the yogic tradition, the idea of being in samsara, of being in a state of mental suffering caused by uh, non-virtuous and repeating mental habits, which create suffering for you and others. Um, so Chen there with compassion is wishing to free beings from being in suffering. And uh, it's said that when uh, Chen was in a seated form, then uh, that was represented by four arms, in fact, two here and two here, and just one head. And um, there's this very interesting story which is told which says that Chen was um, uh, using all the powers of compassion to help other beings come out of mental suffering. And uh, then uh, it's as if these people came out of suffering and then they lost their way again and began to repeat the negative patterns of mental suffering and fell down again. And at this point, Chenerezi experienced a feeling of frustration, which I think you can probably all empathize with. Like, I've helped you, you know, I've helped you to stop drinking or whatever it is, and now, two years later, you're back drinking again. You know, you have that feeling of, oh, I've helped you, but why have you fallen back down again? And so this is the story, and that as a consequence, Chen uh, uh burst. And um, when, uh, w w when uh, he came back together again, uh, he, he had 11 heads and a 1,000 arms because he realized that the determination that he needed to continue, uh, the strength he needed to continue was, was very, very great. And uh, so he sort of mustered all his strength to carry on. And I have to say that, you know, this is um, uh, often the case when you're seeking to help um, other beings. Sometimes it's not a straight line in helping beings. You have to have a lot of determination and, uh, to carry on. So I quite like this, um, this story behind the image. Um, now, as a practitioner, uh, reflecting on this image being able to visualize the image, not as a photograph, but as a presence, a feeling of limitless compassion, generating that feeling and connecting to it, is something that we would do in order to um, connect to it, make it more real for us, you know? Like, a little bit like what happened to me in Jakarta after that incident. I had an understanding of what my emotions were. As a human, I knew anger very well, you know. Uh, I knew I experienced fear and all these sorts of things. But I didn't really know that I had the capacity to feel kindness. And uh, so in, uh, in practice terms, we um, look very clearly at those... Uh, the feeling of kindness and compassion, and we would reflect on it and begin to connect to it more clearly. And in doing so, our connections to less helpful emotions, such as anger, hopefully begin to dissolve at the same time. So I'm just saying that this is an active tool of, of practice because many people want to be kind, but actually, how do you do that? How do you develop kindness apart from in a random way, a random accidental way because you see a lady who needs a shopping picked up? You know, you just do it as a reactive thing. This is about developing a deliberate state of mind which becomes your state of mind, which is there no matter what's happening. So um, this is a, a difference, you could say. This is a difference which comes with deliberate mind training. Yeah. Um, so... I've just put some qualities down here, um, which are, um, you could see them as uh, causes or you could see them all as effects of practicing and training in compassion. Okay, now, and they're not necessarily in the right order here, you know, you can uh, mix them around. One of the um, uh, most important things is that when you're beginning to develop compassion, uh, you see the suffering of others because uh, it's not just a Buddhist way of thinking, it's an actual fact that you, know, you won't encounter anybody in this world who hasn't 
experienced suffering already or will experience suffering. You know, everybody you meet at some point will have lost somebody that they loved or they'll have experienced illness or somebody close to them will have had difficult circumstances. So um, the Buddhism's very sort of, um, uh, and not only Buddhism, <laughs> other, uh, uh, even scientists or anything, are very clear in saying, okay, this, this, is, this human condition is not a bed of roses. It will have some difficult moments in it, some obstacles in it. And um, when you realize that there's suffering in the human condition, then uh, from that realization of suffering, you have the capacity to generate compassion. Yeah. And as you do that, there'll be a growing realization of this shared human condition. You know? Uh, this is why in, in, uh, in many Buddhist prayers we will uh, recognize that we want the same things as humans. All humans wish to be content, you could even say happy, although I think contentment really is a better word. Um, all humans wish to be content, and no human wishes to suffer. You know, no human wishes to deliberately experience suffering. Yeah. And so in recognizing those shared goals, um, there's a sense that we are closer to each other than we imagine. You know, no matter our gender, our uh, where we happen to be born, whether we are rich or poor. Suffering doesn't, uh, as I know from my city experience in being held hostage, you know, money doesn't free you from suffering. It doesn't make you safe from suffering. This is something we're all going to have to share as humans, you know. So it gives you this growing realization of a shared human condition, which from a Buddhist point of view would be seen as a, as a kind of opening of our understanding, opening of your heart and mind. And uh, you would then uh, uh, lead to more clear understanding of compassion, which is this wish that uh, other beings do not suffer. Yes, and you may put that into action. And then, from a from a from a practitioner's point of view, you may develop empathy. Empathy, from a practitioner's point of view, would be seen as a more advanced state than compassion. Because compassion, in, in the, from a practitioner's point of view, would be a little bit more like to observe somebody is in suffering. To observe them in suffering and wish them to be out of suffering. But it's more like an observed state. To develop empathy from a practitioner's point of view is to use all of your understanding and your imagination as if you're actually entering the person, the body of the person who's experiencing suffering and trying to feel from the inside of them, how that is, in order to, to find the best way to help them. Yeah. So there's a difference there, and in practitioners' terms, empathy would be seen as more sophisticated than uh, compassion. But all of those qualities are going to grow out of uh, realizing the suffering of the shared human condition and the, the wish that everybody is out of suffering, you know, this great need that we, we live with a, uh, the reality of compassion. And obviously all of these would dissolve the self-clinging way of thinking, yes? And from a Buddhist point of view, again, predating Buddhism, you know, predating Buddhism in the Indian uh, mainland, in the yogic tradition, the, uh, the root of uh, this school of thinking is that ultimately clinging to a sense of permanent self, separate and most important, from all other aspects around you is in fact the root of your suffering. So compassion is seen as a way of beginning to free you from your own suffering. So although you may imagine, and often in the West people do imagine, that in helping somebody else, they're only helping somebody else. From a Buddhist point of view, it's not possible to talk like that because when you help somebody else, you generate compassion in your own being, and that will, even that little help will begin to dissolve the clinging to yourself. And the clinging to yourself is seen as the ultimate cause of suffering from a uh, Buddhist point of view, not only a Buddhist point of view, but in Eastern uh, philosophy generally, you'll often come across this idea. So, uh, you know, this is where the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, often if you look at his teachings, you'll see that he describes altruism ultimately as a selfish activity and he means that because it's only really in helping others 
that you begin to free yourself from the entrapment of clinging to you. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah? So maybe that's answering slightly some of your earlier questions. Yeah? And uh, in that way, uh, in that way, we come closer to feelings of happiness described from a Buddhist point of view, um, which uh, will, will arise as the um, as the understanding is not throttled by this sense of clinging to a self, then uh, a, a, a very different concept of contentment and happiness will begin to arise through helping others. Yeah. I can see you're all thinking hard, so you can save some questions for me, maybe. Okay. So, um, development through compassion is in many aspects, it's well considered and ultimately it should be of a huge benefit to the practitioner, not just to the uh, recipient. Now, these are actually my teacher's hands, these are my Lama's hands, and this is the symbols of uh, compassion and uh, wisdom within a, a Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So again, in terms of making these mental qualities, which may seem a bit obscure or hard to, hard to grasp, uh, you know, to make them a little bit, something a bit more easier to work with, we've got these visualizations, but we also have these uh, instruments that you can call them. One is called a doje, which again comes from a, a Sanskrit origin of a vajra, a thunderbolt, a vajra. And uh, this is a jubu, this is a bell, um, and uh, these are again they're symbols of this uh, male and female uh, compassion and wisdom these two mental qualities which need to be equally developed and uh, work together in fact in Tibetan Buddhism the symbol for uh, compassion uh, which needs to be unbreakable this quality of a thunderbolt a vajra is actually associated with the male energy and the wisdom uh, in the a bell is associated with the female energy. So, um, yeah, and these are, um, this is my llama. Uh, now, where were we sitting? I can't remember where we were sitting. This is my llama showing me how to um, hold these instruments correctly. And then he, I'm, I can share with you that he actually has given these instruments to me. They're on my shrine at home, and they come from his three-year retreat that... Um, he did, so you can imagine these instruments are very, uh, very precious to me. Um, okay, compassion in action. Yes. So um, there's many ways in which I've been considering and practicing and trying to deliberately practice um, compassion. And in the end, I felt that I really wanted to um, not just pray for these things or say these things, but really put it into action. And so that's, and uh, the, the process uh, of doing that is described towards the, the end of the book and was very much kicked off with meeting Narkum in southwest Bhutan, who uh, has uh, cerebral palsy and had uh, hardly left her house. She was 19. And I think that uh, something in her situation of entrapment really kind of resonated with me from my experience of being held hostage. You know, I kind of just felt this is, a, she's really in a state of entrapment, I have to help her, you know. And so meeting her was really the, the, the thing that made me think, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really take action here. And um, so, I uh, <laughs> Ah, just came back from Bhutan, absolutely convinced that we just, you know, had to set up this charity, and which is now a fully registered charity, and which has achieved many things to help uh, children in Bhutan, speci specifically ones with uh, special needs. And um, I, you know, many times I feel, you know, obviously I wasn't born in Bhutan. I was born in the West. I wasn't born with a full understanding of the Tibetan classical script. Etc. 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 And sometimes I say to and to people, this is this is the best thing for me because these children need somebody to care for them. You know, and uh, sometimes the mountain I have to climb in terms of a practitioner of this lineage with the the prayers and the rituals and the language is enormous. But to spend time with these children and care for them and 
get the mattresses and water heaters. I can do that. You know, I can do that. It's achievable for me, you know. And so uh, I'm very at home when I'm with these uh, children. And increasingly my times in rural Bhutan now, I'm in quite isolated areas where, you know, I'm asked to visit children, etc. And so this is me with another child with cerebral palsy in, in uh, east of Bhutan. And, um, this is what I love most, is just being in, in the field in strange places, uh, you know, being asked to help children or uh, see children who might be enter, able to enter one of our schools. And uh, um, really I'm at my happiest there, feeling that my com uh, the compassion practice I've been trying to do are beginning to bear fruit, you know. This is where I'm really at my happiest, I would say. Mm. So here we have... Um, some of the things that we've done. This is the Rinzin, this is the uh, physiotherapist in East Bhutan that we uh, work with. Um, this is uh, Jigme. Jigme uh, runs the only um, orthotic and prosthetic uh, laboratory in, in, in Bhutan, Gidakom, outside Timpu. This is Sring, and uh, these two have worked together. Now he has a super fantastic um, prosthetic leg and um, this is the sort of things that we, we do, and uh, it's uh, very essential, and occasionally I drop a few kind of tears along the way. Ah, oh, some of this may be uh, no longer appropriate. Now, um, obviously, I just want, want to answer any questions that you have. As I've said there, uh, if you want to help us in a simple way, uh, this girl is the same girl that's on our postcard, actually. She's there. Um, if you want to help us in a simple way today, then if you buy the book, the royalties go to the charity. And if you like the book, please tell everybody else you ever meet uh, with a heartbeat to buy the book. And um, uh, then we have some charity leaflets here showing you some of the things that we've done. And obviously, uh, all of these are produced voluntarily, so nobody in England is employed by the charity, so that all the money goes actually to the end um, project. At the moment, we've got four projects going on in Bhutan, haven't we, Sue? We've got school paths and school toilets in Maritsamo. We're building a dining hall, a kitchen and a storage facility in the special needs school in East Bhutan. Then we are... Uh, working with the Ministry of Labour to employ a new member of staff in the special needs school in Timpu. And I feel like there's something else in my head. Is there something <laughs> else in my head? Else yeah. Well. Uh, but uh, we just presented the school bus that we were working so hard to get the money for. Um, we just, I just presented that in August, which is fantastic, a 32-seater school bus for the special needs school in um, Timpu. So... Yeah, it's been a huge thing to, to launch a charity and run it, and run it kindly, without anger, about the injustices of the world. It's taken a lot of thinking about. So, yeah, so that's my presentation today. So I'm hoping, despite, you know, everything I've already said, you'll still have lots of questions for me, uh, if you'd like to ask any. Yeah? Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Yay. <laughs> We had a late entrance there, late entrance coming in, yeah.